You can stay. I mean, it's, it's, it's comfortable. Comfortable. I whatever you. you're most comfortable with. Oh, all right. Well, I'll just sit right here by you. <laughs> Pardon me? I see you could have kept your tennis shoes on. I could. <laughs> okay, well, th good afternoon to all of you, and I want to um, thank LifeWorks for having us all here today to um, talk about this. Um, LifeWorks is an incredibly great partner in our work around CSEC, and I just want all of you to know that off at the top of an important partnership we have with LifeWorks um, in our collaboration. So our topic today, as Mary said, is one that is troubling, it's shocking, and it's quite frankly unacceptable, and that's the sexual exploitation of youth. However, on the flip side, you will hear us talk about the incredible community response that is taking place around this issue. So commercial sexual exploitation of children, or CSEC as we call it, is happening right here in our neighborhoods. And like so many people I have met, I as well thought of it as more of an international issue, something happening in Eastern Europe and um, Southeast Asia, not here in our high schools, our malls, and on our streets. So when I realized what was happening, I was compelled to um, make this issue a priority and do what I could do to help. So what does it look like? Today in the United States, the average age of entry into prostitution is 12 to 14 years old. Let me repeat that, 12 to 14 years old. We mostly see girls, but it does happen with boys too. The victims are middle school and high school students that have grown up here or have been brought here from cities like Seattle, Reno, or Sacramento. The victims are lured into the life of violence with empty promises of love and a better life. What they experience is having their freedom taken away, struggles with self-worth, and routine verbal, emotional, and physical abuse. So how does it happen? In this fight, we are up against some serious challenges. Pimps are incredibly skilled at picking out kids who are vulnerable. She may be a runaway, or having issues at home, or may just lack the self-confidence that she's worthy <coughs> of love. She could be from a poor family or a rich family. She could be any race or religion. The pimp calls her baby, honey, girlfriend, buys her things and showers her with attention. She's groomed and convinced that the pimp is her boyfriend, and he's the only one that loves her. This soon is replaced by the pimp forcing her to have sex with strangers for money. If she doesn't cooperate, she's beaten or drugged or both. She's then sold on the internet or on the street. She keeps very little, if any at all, of the money that she makes. <coughs> the pimp makes her rely on him for food, shelter, and basic necessities, all the while telling her he really loves her. This cycle creates a trauma bond between pimps and victims that is so strong, it's incredibly difficult for them to escape. Catching and prosecuting pimps and protecting victims is hard enough, but there's another element to this fight against exploitation that requires attention, and that is demand. This is our most difficult part of the problem to tackle Without the demand for younger and younger children to purchase, we wouldn't see pimps go out of their way to recruit and to continue to exploit victims. Right now, we can't even begin to quantify how many people are buying sex, but our partners in law enforcement have story after story, as I'm sure Sergeant Kiger could tell you. These buyers trade stories online, give tips to each other, and um, share advice. Buyers are exposing themselves and their partners to sexually transmitted diseases. They're breaking the law, and they're oblivious to the fact that they are perpetuating the violent cycle for these young victims. Without demand, there would be no need for a supply of increasingly younger victims. Buyers are driving 
commercial sexual exploitation of children has a large impact on our region. In neighborhoods where there is established street prostitution, or tracks as they are called, neighbors have to deal with buyers circling their houses, watching as victims are bought and sold, sometimes right in their front yards, and, uh, and uh, having to worry about protecting their children as they are propositioned on their way home from school. In government, we see huge costs associated with getting victims the services they need to recover from the intense trauma and violence they experience while exploited. In society, we see impact in families torn apart, the intense pressure on youth, and the continued devaluing of human worth. While we still have more to do, I am very proud of the work we have done at Multnomah County to combat CSEC. Over the last four years, in partnership with the City of Portland, the State of Oregon, elected officials, child welfare, <coughs> nonprofits, community members, victim services, advocates, survivors, faith groups, and so many more, we've accomplished more than I could have imagined. I told you we had a lot of partners sitting at the table, didn't I? And we do. <laughs> Today, we have a law that posts the National Trafficking Hotline number in establishments that sell alcohol. That's the sticker on your um, tables, and you can post them anywhere you want. They don't have to be in a particular establishment. So the resource is available 24-7 in multiple languages to take calls from people who someone suspect is being trafficked. Um, they connect uh, people to anti-trafficking resources and provide technical assistance and answer questions. And you can see the number on there, 1-888-373-7888. Um, now we were just talking prior to, <laughs> to being here and um, so we think that the real value of that number is if you see something, if you see something in your neighborhood, if you have a neighbor and you think there's something going on there, or you have a friend, or you, um, a situation where you don't really want, you, you just feel something is really happening there, this is a number to call where they'll route it back here. Now, if you see something actually happening, um, then it's better to call 911. Um, so that's so. There's really two different um, situations, but um, um, and, and that's kind of the difference. So they're both valuable, but just if you see something happening, you really should call 911. We have imposed increased fines for buyers. We have made it easier for our prosecutors to put away pimps, and we always have an eye on. In the next legislative session, we will continue to work on passing laws that make it easier to convict buyers and pimps. Together as a community, we can continue to craft a comprehensive response to this complex problem. In the last three years, we have been awarded grants to assist in our collaborations, and that's what we were talking about earlier, having all of our partners sitting at the table. We've established shelter options, which has been a huge missing piece, and um, you know, it's not, it doesn't come close to being enough shelter beds, but it's a start. We're working together to hold buyers accountable. Currently, buyers who are caught purchasing sex from victims over 18 years of age are sent to a diversion program, and this diversion program is administered by LifeWorks. We continue to make the system respond in a way that is more victim focused. There is now a CSEC specific unit in child welfare. And we have someone here from there. Our local police and district <coughs> attorneys are training all across the nation. And we've increased the number of vic <coughs> victim advocates. Now, these are big steps forward, but it's still not enough. We need more housing options for victims. We need to make it easier for our par a law partners enforcement to go after buyers and pimps. We have to take on demand as a society. We have to focus on prevention, including teaching the importance of self-esteem and healthy relationship skills in our schools. We need to challenge the media outlets that sexualize youth and portray unrealistic 
ideals for girls. We must give our young boys the tools to be responsible, thoughtful young men. These are not easy tasks, but together we can make the difference, which means me to the most important piece of our ability to end modern day slavery. We need people like all of you. Collectively, we have to decide if we want to live in a community, a city, a state, a country, a world that allows exploitation to continue. We need to decide if we want to stand by idly as 12 year olds <coughs> are bought and sold right here in our backyard, or are we going to stand up and say no more? We are always <coughs> looking for additional partners that can help us to end the commercial sexual exploitation of our children, whether it's hosting a clothing drive for victims or donating gift cards to help pay for a warm meal, generating awareness of or helping a craft a marketing campaign for the efforts. We need your help, your ideas, and your influence. Thank you again for having me here today, and I look forward to continuing our conversation and working in partnership to take action to end the commercial sexual exploitation of children. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> this criminal phenomenon kind of struck Portland in the Northwest um, in a way that I think few other topics have. Uh, there were a lot of national media stories from, uh, from a Dan Rather report, ABC News Nightline, <clears throat> and there ended up being this rather bright spotlight shined on Portland. We had terms such as the epicenter of child sex trafficking. Portland was a national hub. And all of this, of course, gathered a lot of attention, uh, most of it not very good. One of the things that I've known about all of this, though, is even though there was this publicity going on at a national level, Portland and Multnomah County weren't waiting or responding to that news story. Portland and Multnomah County had already been engaged in an effort to identify who these children are and develop some systems to try and help them uh, that predated that publicity. And one major component of that was LifeWorks Northwest and the Sexual Assault Resource Center. Years ago, <clears throat> and I know Corey can speak to this, but with the new options for women and their program that they were working with, our East Precinct Patrol, they, they've been engaged in this effort of trying to help women who were caught up in this for a really long time. And one of the things that I've always thought was so commendable about the way that they do this is that the idea is that they are able to leave the life that is so mm -hmm. detrimental to them while holding them accountable but providing counseling services and always working with them with the idea of making their life better and to, and to place them less at risk than what they are when they're out walking on 82nd. And <clears throat> they ended up growing from that and becoming a valuable partner with us by providing counseling services for our juvenile trafficking victims. <coughs> Without that kind of mental health and counseling support, we wouldn't have uh, the results that we're seeing now. So we began to respond by trying to figure out, okay, what are we going to do with this? Number one, we had to figure out who were these kids. And I'll tell you, that's one of the biggest hurdles that we have is victim identification. And the reason that's, that's so important is because they don't report. They don't call 911 to make a police report. They don't ask a police officer to take a report and talk about their victimization. Not only do they not self-report as victims, in many circumstances, they don't self-identify as a victim either. We can always keep in mind that these are children, they think like children, they process like children, but the way that trauma affects children is so dramatic that they're not even, I don't even think that they're really aware of the full extent of their victimization. All of that ends up creating some major hurdles for law enforcement and social services if we're going to identify them and try to determine what kind of resources we can bring to bear on their behalf. So what we began to do is put together a team of direct service providers, and that core group, really, of those that are most directly involved, includes LifeWorks Northwest, the Sexual Assault Resource Center, DHS Child Welfare, which, as uh, Commissioner McKeel mentioned, they created their own unit 
I don't know of any other DHS unit in the entire country that has a staff of CPS workers that are dedicated to these kinds of child exploitation cases. So that's just amazing. And I speak all across the country and nobody's ever heard of anything like this before. And then of course our prosecutor's office. Uh, Multnomah County has dedicated a prosecutor, J.R. Ujafusa, who is just this amazing man who both trains, but he works so closely with law enforcement that he begins working with us from the very beginning to prosecute these cases. The other thing that's occurred, Amanda Marshall, who's the new United States Attorney for the District of Oregon, she's been in office for, I think, just over a year. She reconfigured her office, placed three assistant U.S. attorneys to directly support our trafficking efforts. And as a result of all of that, we indicted 13 federal cases last year, up from four the previous and zero the year before that. Now, as far as the community and how do we do that, as I began thinking about the progress that we've made over the last couple of years, I began thinking about who are our partners, what kind of partners are they, what are they doing, and how, how are we doing? It's sort of a self-evaluation kind of thing. And one of the things that I've come to realize, it's not just because we have DHS child welfare, it's not just because we have advocacy, it's not just because we have counseling services. <coughs> what makes this so successful is the people here who hold those positions. It's the people who are part of the Sexual Assault Resource Center. It's the character and integrity and the compassion of the people who work daily with these youngsters. It's LifeWorks Northwest who provide counseling services to them when they're in crisis, who talk with them through the trauma and the tears and the emotion. They stay with them hoping to bring some healing to them. And child welfare are always tracking them. What a frustrating job because there's a lot of commitments that are imposed on them at the state level. There's a lot of bureaucracy, there's a lot of rules, and there's also a lot of negative publicity that gets thrown at child welfare. What I've seen is we have the most amazing group of child welfare workers of any place I've ever been or seen <coughs> or heard of. And so what has resulted in is we have a cohesive group who is dedicated to one mission, and that is the recovery and the restoration of these children. It's the identification of the people who are victimizing them and holding them accountable. So not just dealing with the traffickers, the buyers, we have an entire unit, our East Precinct Prostitution Coordination Team, arrests on average 100 plus Johns per year. So we've got very specific missions dedicated for going after the demand side of the equation, and we've got an entire team in place that's going after the traffickers. The problem is still this, it's still victim identification, and it is the business model that supports and encourages the trafficking of our children. Now, I won't say that, <coughs> um, that we're seeing an end to it. What we're seeing is a transition in the way that they're engaging in their criminal model. It used to be, matter of fact, three years ago, it was not uncommon to see a teenager being trafficked out on 82nd Avenue. You won't see that anymore. Then we began seeing this massive numbers of juveniles who were being posted on Craigslist before it was shut down and then Backpage.com. The more that we engage in efforts to go after those kinds of resources, the further underground they move. They're now starting to use the chat services and what's even more insidious about what they're doing is they're beginning to sell children just simply known client lists where they never surface on any kind of radar that we can find. So our only recourse is the support services that are here in place locally that can identify them. So some of the processes that have been put in place are things what I would call early warning systems, where when a runaway child goes to Janice Youth Center, to Harry's mother, the staff there knows to begin asking a series of screening kinds of questions to try and find out if they're at risk for sexual exploitation. And if any of the risk elements are hit, or if it's even an anonymous call to child welfare, an investigation immediately happens and a sexual assault resource center advocate is assigned to that child. And they begin working with them, trying to break through the barriers that are in place in order to get them to ultimately trust us and to be able to disclose, uh, <coughs> disclose information to us about their exploiters. And what we've been seeing as a result of this is a, a lessening of the time from what I would call identification to disclosure. What we're always working to do is narrow this gap between identification and finally disclosure. It used to be 
that we would identify a child and it would take one to two years before we would start getting information from them. And uh, now there's an awful lot of occasions where we're getting it right off the bat where they're starting to disclose to us very quickly. So that has been very helpful. And the way, the, I think the reason that's successful is because of the partnerships that are in place. SARC will call us, even though it's a confidential uh, uh, advocacy type service, if the child is willing to disclose to law enforcement, they will let us know. If there are things that DHS learns that needs to be passed on to, to law enforcement, they let us know. As a matter of fact, whenever a call goes into the child abuse hotline and there's an allegation of child exploitation, they immediately notify us as well. So what we do is we work as a team approach, and it's the team approach that I think is successful, but it's a tribute to the people who are involved in it. Well, so I, you know, I encounter these kids in the emergency room and the psych unit uh, at LifeWorks when I was there and at, um, at a residential program where I work. And there are a number of barriers that uh, I think these kids face in, as far as accessing, you know, appropriate level of services, what they need. And the biggest barrier, I think, Also, medical providers who are supposed to really have awareness of, of this issue based on the number of kids that they encounter, <coughs> such as in the emergency room, who really have some weird inherent bias and, and thoughts, belief that these are kids that are choosing, willfully choosing a life like this. And it's essentially they are discriminated face, um, you know, they don't present as the perfect victim. They present in an emergency room, they're withdrawn, they don't trust the system of care, they can be combative, irritable, and it's a lot different than, you know, a typical child that has been brought in who has allegations of sexual abuse by a family member or a known rel you know, relative or friend of the family. So, what I've so far is that people can change their understanding of this issue. And that's really what I've been trying to focus on. And the way I've been trying to do that is just by educating people. And it's not an easy task. I think there is, you know, again, people have their beliefs about it. And when you try and shift that, there's, there's going to be some resistance. But I feel like I've gotten through to some people. I think in order to do that, you have to understand what you know the details about it, and understand what drives this for the, the kids and for the traffickers and even the buyers. And so I just want to talk a little bit about that. Um, really, I mean, the, what we're talking about is called actually domestic minor sex trafficking, and that's a, a form of CSEC. That's been identified actually by. But it also points out the psychological manipulation that's used. And I think more importantly, it talks about the rights that these kids are entitled to, including not to be detained in, uh, you know, in jail or detention, uh, protection that they should be receiving, and also the right to medical care. And you know, overall, I mean, society in, in this country has really not been living up to the expectations that this law had would be placed. So a little bit about the demographics. Um, just a random survey of 13,000 adolescents found that 3.5% of them have exchanged sex for something, uh, be it you know money, drugs, place to stay. And that's just random kids, these aren't runaway kids. But when you apply that to have run away, the number goes up dramatically, and it's, they're, they're 
based on estimates that it's 30 percent. So uh, runaway kids are our primary targets, and they're easy because they need things. They need a place to stay. They need food, shelter. They they have found that two thirds of them <coughs> have a proposition. Uh, people wait at you know group homes. They wait at shelters, uh, bus stations, and really go after them as soon as they run away with this you know promise of something. And you know there's different estimates on the number of runaway kids out there in the country, somewhere around two million or so. And that's a lot of kids. I mean, there's it's we don't really have accurate numbers of how much this is going on. In Portland, but it's 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 pretty staggering. I think when you think about that ratio. So again, the issues with CSAC, the biggest issues I think are this belief that kids are what we call prostitutes, and that they're child prostitutes, and that they are um, choosing this kind of lifestyle, and and that's just a myth that goes on, and that's really been clearly defined in the federal law as not being accurate. The other problem, of course, is the lack of resources that we have. And, and you know, when we face that, then we have to ultimately put kids in either detention or in a hospital. And that, you know, that has fallouts. Uh, kids tend to see themselves as either mentally ill or as criminals, and they lose access to other resources that they could get. So there's a number of ways that these kids are getting recruited. Um, you know, parents selling their children. Heard of kids being forced into it, uh, kidnapped essentially. Uh, there's false advertising. Uh, other kids actually who are in the life uh, drawing in some of their peers, you know, internet enticement. And the biggest one, of course, is this kind of seduction and coercion, this false illusion that traffickers go after uh, kids pretending to be the boyfriend. So a little bit about the buyers, though. These tend to be uh, typically men, of course, of all ages, professions, socioeconomic backgrounds. Most are actually looking, they're, they're drawn to youth. They're not necessarily looking for kids under the age of 18. There is a subset that are specifically looking for children, but the, the vast majority are just drawn to this, and then when they find out, if they find out, then they turn a blind eye to it. Um, there's been a lot of barriers to prosecuting buyers, and that's something that you know, our community really needs to focus on. Uh, an example, actually, is one that I read about was in Nevada. There was a 12-year-old uh, girl that actually got into a truck, and she, uh, a policeman saw this and actually went in and Accepted the, the, this before it happened. There was money about to be exchanged. She admitted that she was, you know, about to perform sexual favors, and he arrested her and let the the fifty-year-old trucker go. So, you know, fortunately, I think our police force has been really well versed and aware of this problem to the point that that doesn't happen here. Um, a little bit about traffickers, you know, the, the problem is the society regards them as stylish, hip. Uh, they don't really think about the degradations and inconvenience and demoralizations that can occur. They're, um, you know, they have a number of stages, as Commissioner McKeel mentioned, that they, you know, are able to recruit kids. And they, there are guides out there on this. There are books, there are, you know, videos on it. And, and it's pretty disturbing. They really focus on what kids need at the time. You know, if they're runaways or if they have dysfunctional families, uh, they'll specifically target that. You know, similar to Maslow's hierarchy of needs. The motivation is is purely financial. I mean, it's ridiculous how much money that people can make, and it's, they're not being taxed. <coughs> on this. There's a relatively low low risk. And <coughs> it's all driven by demand. The victims have typically have a number of risk factors. You know, they have a history of abuse. They've had CPS involvement, uh, parental drug use, overboy, uh, boyfriends. Uh, they 
runaway, single parent families, history of mental health issues, the biggest risk factor though is age and any kid can be targeted and so um, we encounter kids that come from pretty much every background. And, and so that the question becomes in a lot of people's minds is why don't they just leave? Why don't they walk away? And, and that's where the concept of trauma bonds comes in and kids are susceptible to this, especially if they come from a background where they didn't have a family. They have a, uh, you know, they come from essentially a broken home. Then there's this illusion of what they're getting, what somebody is actually uh, giving them this, this, you know, idealized family, essentially, is what they try and provide. So they're, they're stuck, they're, they're connected to this person, despite being, you know, regularly beaten, um, obviously exploited, they see themselves as connected to this person, either it's a, usually it's their boyfriend, you know, this is just kind of further exemplified by the use of changing their names, essentially, to, to create another identity, using names like daddy and baby, which just reinforce this idea that it's a, a family. You know, the other barriers, of course, to leaving is that they, these kids don't have money. They see it as their fault. They, um, they fear retribution. I've heard of a number of kids that, encountered a number of kids that actually So they, there's also, in, in our line of work, there's a, an incredible mistrust towards the system. And that's been pretty much embedded in their beliefs since, since day one. And it, it just continues to, to make it difficult to work with these kids, especially on the, when they first encounter. And that's the, you know, the challenges, I think, that LifeWorks and the other providers in the community face. So, you know, when they present to us, they come in through a number of ways. They are often brought in by police and sting operations, or they, they come in for injuries into the emergency room. And there's a number of risk factors that we have to look in seeing, you know, working with these kids and, and trying to identify them. They don't come out and say that, you know, they're being trafficked. And, you know, really, they have this inherent avoidance to any system of care that makes it difficult. So once they're identified and you know begin to, to engage in some form of treatment, we see a number of conditions in which they struggle with PTSD, anxiety disorders, depression, substance problems. Um, and, and really treatment focuses on forming trust with them. And that's the initial step to try and engage them. And, and again, I mean, with some of their backgrounds, it's a, it's a really challenging the next thing is to try and identify essentially where is that major deficit that was exploited by the trafficker and really try and come up with other more creative and more um, harmless ways of, of getting those kids. So I think, you know, it, it, I guess in summary really, I mean, there's certain things that, you know, society we need to do biggest thing is to recognize this issue and that it's an issue comparable to modern day slavery and it's fueled by demand and it's continuing and then recognize that the kids that you know we are working with are by federal law have rights to receive services and they should not be criminalized uh, you know as parents we can try and identify and, and provide supervision so that kids aren't being aren't being exploited and aren't being pulled in. But, you know, with the recognition that this is a, an ongoing problem and it's gonna continue without stricter, uh, stricter measures to, to target traffickers and buyers and really eliminate it. And Portland is a hotspot, uh, Nevada is a hotspot. And, you know, I guess 10 years ago, I never would have thought that, you know, something like a strip club would be uh, connected to something like this. Kids are um, unfortunately being exploited right
right to strip clubs. And you know, we tend to have a pretty laid back approach about uh, things such as the adult industry. And that unfortunately just fuels the demand problem and has contributed to the still poor in the long term. So I think there's things as society we can do to try and address that. And you know, it all starts with awareness. So, yeah. Should we open it up to questions? Yeah, I think somebody yeah. has one right here. Okay. <coughs> I'll start, hopefully we'll get other people started. First of all, thank you, the three of you, for taking your time to be with us today and talk about this difficult subject. It's really interesting to hear from each one of the different perspectives. Um, but really quickly, if given the kind of, re I guess two, one is you haven't told us how many kids we're really talking about the region, I'd love to hear that. But second, from each one of you, very shortly, given the resources, reasonable resources that we have, and what you know, what would you do in the calendar year 2013? What would be the number one thing that you would do that would have the most effect in terms of uh, uh, dealing with this issue? So maybe the first question, a sense of how many kids are we talking about at any one time that are? <coughs> at any one time, there are between 150 and 250 identified kids. Identified, the key word. <laughs> right. identified. And now these are what I would call known or suspected three primary sources of information where we can get this from. One is DHS Child Welfare, and they become a primary information <coughs> source because they're mandatory reporters, and so ultimately all allegations of child abuse have to go through DHS. DHS is now tracking all of that. They've got specialized caseworkers, so they that's one source. The second source is SARC, Sexual Assault Resource Center. While they don't disclose to us who the kids are, they can disclose to us how many kids are on their caseload. And then the third source is law enforcement. Those are the three primary possessors of information. Um, my unit last, uh, in 2012, I assigned 76 cases for investigation. Um, and these were cases where there was enough information to support that it was a child sex trafficking case um, enough to assign it to an investigator. I only had four full-time four full-time detectives, but we're part of a federal task force, which equals eight total investigators. Two FBI, a uh, Tiger detective, Beaverton detective, and a Vancouver, Washington detective makes up for the federal task force here locally. So those numbers are, um, that's a lot when we're talking around 200 kids. Um, especially when you think about the amount of resources that are required for each child and also how long it takes from identification before it finally brings to some sort of resolution. It's months and months and months of work. And sometimes we've got cases where we have been working off and on for years. So where the child is just not, just not there yet. Or they'll go from one trafficking situation and we get them out of. We have some cases where the pimp has been arrested, prosecuted, and sentenced, and then the <laughs> child is back with another pimp. So it's a very deep, deep problem. Uh, so what I would want for 2013, uh, I was just having a conversation earlier with Nina and with Sark, and what we need to do is, I think what we have to do is we haven't been talking enough because we got too sidetracked with our own work. And what results from that is, is we lose track of each other and I think our efforts tend to stall a little bit. So what I resolve to do this year is to pay much closer attention to our partners, to our friends that are helping us, and to create a better dialogue so we create a better tracking system for the children so that we know who, wh which one of the most active cases. We, we've not been communicating as well as we should, so we will be My number one thing for 2013, certainly we will continue to work on all of the uh, issues that we've talked about. Where I would like to see more focus, and, and we plan to put more focus, is on the prevention side of it, of the issue. And we need to get <coughs> to children. We need to get, um, as I talked about earlier, we need to have, um, we need to have some influence in schools and with groups that have groups or children focus groups to um, build the self-esteem, help
healthy relationships. Um, teach the young men, as I said, how you be responsible, have the young boys. Um, and I think we need to work on, um, uh, there, there is some curriculum out there around that, but I think we need to work on a, a more robust curriculum to, to get to the kids. Um, there are certainly, you know, those issues go to a number of things that young children are dealing with today. Bullying, gangs, teen dating violence, human trafficking, all of those things. So, um, more focus on the prevention side of it. I have two actually major issues that I'd like to focus on. The biggest one that I might be able to have an impact on is having a safe place for these kids to go. Uh, you know, they show, they are brought into the emergency room and either the hospital is full can't access any other programs, and we're faced with, you know, what to do, and, and there are really are limited options, so, you know, DHS, unfortunately, has to sit there while come up with some sort of plan, and, you know, a kid may end up at <coughs> a, a, a program where they can't be contained, and the, that trauma bond is so strong that they run, they run, and we don't have Not everybody fits that mold, and not every not every kid uh, has you know underlying mental health issues so that they can access that. So we need something a little more comprehensive and universal. The other thing, as an idealist, that I'd like to see happen is really um, strict uh, focus on demand because this is driven by that in particular, and we you know as a society need to come up with ways to. actually have outlawed actually the buying of sex uh, outright, so including adults, and it's, it's the numbers show that it's actually had a pretty significant impact on the community. So, you know, I mean, I think I agree with prevention, and I think it's, it's <coughs> important to, to educate people. I think there's going to continue to be, I mean, the, the money, the temptation to do this for the traffic curious, um, is it the demand that makes this area um, so ripe with it? Is that what it is? Or what is it that makes us a hub or an epicenter? And I take it Nevada is as well. What is it in those environments that makes this so desirable? Well, I, I, first of all, I, <coughs> I wouldn't describe Portland as the epicenter. Okay. I was um, just quoting right. what you said last year, Heather. That's, that's, that was a label that was given here. The problem is, is if you look deeply enough, you'll find that we're not actually the epicenter. Um, because that sort of denotes that this is sort of the center of all things child sex trafficking. And the reality is, is that the numbers don't bear that out. That's uh, good to know. Uh, <laughs> it feels better. Uh, Seattle actually has more kids trafficked in Seattle than Portland does. And so does Dallas, Texas. And so do a number of other cities. And so it becomes more complicated when we talk about what the issues are. We have a significant number of adult businesses in Portland. We have about 50 all nude strip bars in Portland. Seattle, I think, has four. Uh, Dallas, Texas, a city three times the size of Portland, has three. And they're all relegated to the warehouse district. So you would think that because we have all these adult businesses, there must be tens of thousands of kids identified every year that are being trafficked with this stuff. So what that does is it just leaves us scratching our heads going, well, okay, well then what is going on here? My personal opinion about what's facing Portland is a combination of geography, um, accessibility, significant numbers of homeless and vulnerable youth, uh, which these, I would say, apply to lots of other places as well. 
But because of where Portland is located, because it's only three hours from Seattle, and there's also Tacoma, and then along this I-5 corridor, it creates the perfect way to move children up and down. And so when you think about the business model that fuels this, it is the movement of children from one place to another for the purpose of controlling them, to keep them away from any source of safety, security, the people that they know, and for profit. And the third thing is to avoid detection by law enforcement. So with this I-5 corridor, what we've come to call the West Coast Track, has become the perfect sort of geographical tool for move, moving kids up and down. But what's happened with the internet, it has created the merger of demand and anonymity. And that is the one of the things that's so difficult about the internet. Because of all the websites that continue to crop up, they closed down Craigslist, though I will tell you it's still being used under personals and those kinds of things. But Backpage.com is flagrant, even though they have all these disclaimers and everything. Well, there's new websites popping up all over the place. They've got them embedded within pornography sites. Uh, they're just all over the place. I mean, I can think off the top of my head a dozen common ones that are being used here in Portland. So if a person can, without anybody knowing it, simply surf the internet and pick up a phone and ask for somebody to stop by, that is a very difficult thing to get a handle on. So that's one of the things that we're up against as well. So as far as legislative issues, it may be that we talk about things like, you know, identification, proof of, proof of age, I, I don't know. Uh, we need at some point to, to address the issue of making certain that children are not employed in certain kinds of businesses, um, that there needs to be some verification process that a person posting for what is clearly adult services, that we're confident that they are the age that they say they are. And also, and I know the attorney generals all across the country have been applying a great deal of pressure to Backpage. And as a result, they have become more cooperative with law enforcement and now sending more and more uh, uh, referrals to us. So, um, Portland, I think, is just caught up with the same thing that so many other cities. Now, here's what's bad. It's growing in Medford. Okay. It's growing in Medford. It's growing in Olympia. It's growing in Tri-Cities and Moses Lake and Hermiston and the Tri-Cities in Ontario. And Bend and Roseburg and Eugene uh, and on and on and on. There's been an uptick in Medford. And the reason that I think there's been an uptick in Medford is because it's the perfect stop-off point when you're going down, because it's five and a half hours from Portland, and when you're leaving Tacoma and you're gonna stop for the night, they're stopping in Medford. So I communicate fairly regularly with them. And there is a huge uptick in Odessa, Texas. So go figure. Odessa is a city of about 50,000 people, and they've got probably, on an average day, they'll post 75 escort ads on Backpage. So what we're dealing with here is a significant problem, and it's deep. Nancy Preston. <laughs> <laughs> and I think it's important to remember that it is everywhere. Um, and and um, sometimes when I'm talking with other county commission, my colleagues uh, around the state, they'll sometimes they'll say, well, we don't hear much about it in our county. And I'm like, I can guarantee you it's there. <laughs> you just need to look. It is, you know, it's not just Portland issue as Mike has identified, but it's all it's rural, very rural areas as well. And, um, and the danger, one of the reasons why I've always resisted so vigorously saying that Portland is the hub or the epicenter, the reason I don't even like to go there is because it, it in some ways gives everybody else a pass on it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, because if they can slough it off onto Portland, then it, it gives them a certain amount of deniability in their own communities, and I think that's ultimately children, especially since we know that they're being moved from place to place, so I'm not willing to give any community a pass on it. But it's, you know, <coughs> that's interesting, and a lot of what you, you all have been discussing is very discouraging, there's a little <coughs> bit of encouragement there, and, and some of what seems to be discouraging might actually be encouraging. You, you made a comment that um, DHS, for instance, in Oregon is more actively engaged than, maybe the only Department of Human Services, 
engaged in the in the United States and helping to uh, deal with this problem. So, is there an opportunity to use um, create a model here in terms of what's being done, even on the scale that's being done, which not, might not be a big scale in terms of dealing dealing effectively with the problem for us here, but to create a model that you can take to these other communities, look for some sort of support, probably not gonna find it from government, I mean, just the money's not there from government support, um, but take it to corporate America, take it to some institution that would be willing to help fund this approach and create, make Portland an epicenter, not for the problem, but for dealing with the problem. Do you think there's any potential for doing that? Going to what you said earlier in terms of working more closely with some of the other entities that are involved no, in I, I absolutely do, and I know, <clears throat> I have an opportunity periodically to speak at different points around the country, and I was actually just speaking at a conference in December in Washington, D.C. And I had an opportunity to meet advocates from all up and down the eastern seaboard who showed up in Washington. And what I heard is the same story that I hear everywhere I go. There is this broken and fractured relationship between child welfare and law enforcement and between advocacy and law enforcement. It's this adversarial relationship and it's not the kind of partnerships that we have. And when I tell them about the relationships that we have, their response is, is do you do contract work? <laughs> you know, could you come to our community? And so I think absolutely we can. It just, I think it's just how do we do that exactly? And, and because I do think that we have a model that is, is definitely something to be emulated because it's a model that, that creates success out of partnership and working together. It comes from mutual respect for the role that each has where LifeWorks does not try to be the police officer. We don't try to be the mental health counselor. We expect SARC to be the advocate, not us. We want them to be the advocate. They want us to be the police. And so through this mutually supporting, mutually respectful relationship where we each value and uh, the merits that each one brings, then you'll start to see some success. So what it's gonna take, I think, is maybe maybe a larger effort if that's going to take place of talking about very specific things about how you structure your systems in a partnership. So people are asking, people are hearing about it. I suppose the question is, is how do we market it better? And I think we have, I just wanted to, I just wanted to follow up on that. We have begun that work through the um, grant that I talked about that the county received from, it's from the Department of Justice and that's our CSEC work group that we have and we really do have all the partners sitting at the table and we have committees on victim services, we have legislation, we have um, different um, areas uh, ending demand, we have um, for, for the appropriate people to, to work in. As uh, Mike said, we have a number of partners here that are very effective at what they do and one of the things we need to do is stay out of other people's lanes if that's not really our strength. And you know, for us at the county, our strength is being able to um, to be a convener, to be um, to uh, affect legislation, to raise awareness around that. And um, so those are our strengths. Um, but we are we are seeing that happen with the CSEC group. And actually, there are. Um, the head of our CSEC and um, uh, have, has gone and spoken with other parts of the country about our model and how that's working out. So we just need to strengthen that and make sure we bring more partners and all the appropriate partners that we keep them engaged and where they're going. But we, yes, we are we are working on that model. In fact, we're, we've been working on it for about three years now. Discuss this a lot. There is certainly potential to 
broaden that, um, that base of how we get out into the schools. And um, um, we, um, we are also working with some of the schools, like, like St. Mary's High School has an entire uh, group of students around this issue, and they form their own nonprofit, and they're just going after this issue. So, we, so there's, there's a, a group called Oregonians Against Trafficking Humans. That's, um, they're more active in, in uh, colleges right now at University of Oregon and uh, University of Portland uh, that have chapters there and, and are very active in going out and bringing the awareness. So I think there's kind of two pieces. We need to get into the schools to really, um, to really have the young, the young people understand how you, uh, you know, what's appropriate behavior, what's a healthy relationship, those sorts of things. The other thing that's important is having the youth voices with us because um, we know, I know I can go to a high school and I can talk and they'll be very respectful and they'll listen, but if one of their own peers is talking to them, it's gonna make the biggest difference. Mm -hmm. um, so that's kind of where we're moving. We, there, we, I think we need to do more work in that area as well. So I hate to be the time cop, but I guess that's one of my jobs. It's, it's one o'clock. Let's give a big round of applause. Yeah. Bringing this to our attention, we, we call this uh, Let's Talk About It, and uh, you now know a lot more than an awful lot of people know in this region about this subject, and I would hope that when you hear people talk about it, that, that you're going to have the, the strength and ability perhaps to bring some, uh, some real background as to what the level of the problem is and maybe send them the right, direct, in the right direction if, if they've got the wrong impression about where they're going. Um, once again, don't forget to get your uh, parking stamp if you would like that. Um, we try to put these on two or three times every year, and if you've got a, a thought in terms of a topic that you'd like, we're always interested in hearing that. And uh, of course, we're always interested in seeing you in April at our annual breakfast as well. So thanks for being here today. We're adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Look at it on Saturday. Where do you want to? Let's see it move. Yeah, it's going to take a while.